mid-range and tweeter modules. Maybe I'll watch it. Okay, so what we're doing now is the first thing you do is once you get the towers into the room, you unscrew the uh, these nice wheeled feet that allows you to gently pull them out of the woofer cabinet. One of the upgrades that's really welcome is to add Wilson's new acoustic diode feet. Um, I think in some ways it's sort of their version of the isoacoustics, but it's a totally different uh, methodology in terms of how it does it. Okay, so now that the woofer's set up and we've got the spikes on Teflon coasters, we're then gonna add the mid-range and tweeter module to the top of the woofer cabinet. And as you see down here, we've got the acoustic diodes punching into a brass cup that's actually on top of a Teflon furniture slider. So today we're here with Peter McGrath from Wilson Audio. We're very fortunate to have uh, Peter, one of the great setup people in our industry, here to help us dial in the, the new Alexia Vs. Well, first and foremost, we're really not starting from scratch because these speakers, this particular pair of Alexia Vs are replacing uh, the Alexia Twos, which have occupied this uh, very similar and close spot here in this room for the previous five or six years, which I installed for you, Lee, five years ago. Uh, or so ago. Yeah. And, and they've given you great service, and now uh, we're going to the newer version of the same speaker. And given that it's physically very similar in size, the placement, uh, normally we'd go through a process called defining the zone of neutrality. But we've already been through that in the previous speaker, and nothing in the room has changed dramatically. But what might have changed is the seating position ever so slightly, and also the chair I'm sitting in now is different than the chair that was here originally. So that might dictate some slight variations. And also this is a different speaker where the nomographs that we refer to um, might have different uh, calibrations as well. So anyway, the concept of the nomograph is this, is that we take a measurement of the height of the ear off the ground, which Lee and I have done. And I did that as fitting a custom suit I did it with Lee's ears, not mine. And it turns out that in his relaxed position in this chair, he would sit approximately 41 inches. His, the, his ear canal would be 41 inches off the ground. Then what I do is I take a tape measure from the ear canal to the front baffle of the loudspeaker. Um, and allowing for the fact that in the case of the Alexia V, that baffle is about, the top of the baffle is about an inch further back than the bottom is because our newest model has a slight backward rake. So taking that into account, I measured a distance of exactly eight feet, six inches from the ear to the front baffle. So then what we do is we take those values and we go to the book, which has a whole series of calibration numbers. Uh, and we look at the various parameters and we will wind up setting if spikes are needed for the various modules, we will put in the appropriate spike. There's also a sliding step block where we can land the spike on the appropriate setting, et cetera, et cetera. And of course the tweeter module, which is the top module, moves independently of the mid-range module and that can also be moved forward and aft and, this, and with a slight change in the rake angle as you do it. The whole concept behind this is to align all of the drivers so that they're in a very precise time alignment domain. And that, of course, is a feature that is unique. And in the realm of the Wilson audio speakers, it's the model just above the lowest level, which is the Wilson DAW. And this takes what the DAW does to a higher level of precision in the sense that you have an even more independent adjustment of the drivers. and. Uh, the net result of this is that it gives you an even more precise ability to determine the time arrival, which results in greater clarity, imaging, dynamics, you name it. The benefits are manyfold. Okay, as I said before, we, we, we had a good starting point because these speakers are replacing a very similar model that had been here for uh, five years or more. And But what I've done then after uh, starting with that initial placement, as we lay tape down on the ground so that as we move the speakers, 
we have a precise record of where they were and where they're going. And, uh, and, uh, and I'll get more into that a little bit later. But the reality is, is that uh, what we're going to do now is actually play music, or in my case, a specific track, one that I'm familiar with. And most of my dealers who do this also have their favorite track that they work with. What is common to that track is that it should be acoustic in nature. And uh, it's very difficult with very complex tracks to be able to tell with micro movements of the speaker whether you're moving in the right direction or not. And the whole goal of this process is, is to move the speakers around in uh, very precise increments, repeatable increments, increments that you document as the, the, the notes that you take while you're doing it. So that when you find an optimum position, you keep going. And if it's get, you might find an even better one. But if you don't, you always have a precise record of where it was optimum and you can find your way back to it. It's, the notes act like a crumb trail. You're, you're winding through the forest and you found the particularly best spot. You can always go back to that and, and reclaim it. So mm -hmm. that's why the notes are really a critical part of the process. Equally critical in my view is the, is the music that you play. And, and in this case, I play a track that anybody who knows me or is sat through one of these sessions with me will know it's a uh, it's a track by christy moore it's uh, the uh, the irish folk singer and it's called so do i and one of the reasons well several reasons why i love it is that it involves two acoustic guitars one on the left one on the right it involves christy's voice which is uh happens to be centered right around that frequency where most of the nasty room modes are excited and I know for a fact that that voice has no resonant modes in the recording. You can confirm this by listening to it on a really good pair of headphones where there are no room nodes and you'll find that the voice is incredibly beautifully recorded and clear. However, typically when you play it back through most loudspeakers that have not been properly optimized in a room, the voice takes on this kind of a quality or like this and, or it sounds shouty or just doesn't sound natural. So that's the really starting point, the two acoustic guitars. Then there is a, a string bass, which is plucked pizzicato. And it's at the lowest note of the acoustic string bass. And when you get the speakers in the right place in the room, the bass sounds like a visceral vibration through the room, rather than as uh, what was stated to be many years ago, it doesn't sound like a bear slapping a dead fish on the mud. <laughs> it's, it sounds very, very beautiful. And, but sometimes that bass can be too much. That means maybe you're, you're still having a room reinforced boundary mode that you haven't quite resolved yet. So it's a complicated uh, thing to listen to. But as you move the speakers, and sometimes the motion can be as little as a quarter of an inch or even an eighth of an inch, where you'll excite different things. And typically what I start with is... I establish the boundary from the back wall first, move the speaker fore and aft relative to the back wall. Once I've gotten, in, and all of this is, is retained within the zone of neutrality, which we will have established uh, for the first time. Um, then what you do is you can then, after you've gotten the fore and aft, you play a little bit with the side to side. In other words, how much spacing you put between the, the two speakers. It sounds much, it's much more difficult to explain verbally than it is to actually achieve functionally. So I'm using a lot of words to describe a process that if you're experienced in doing it is almost intuitive. Um, and, uh, but what I find really fascinating about this process is that I don't know of any way to measure it, you know, with microphones and graphs and oscilloscopes. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of, it's a totally subjective thing, but what's so beautiful about the WASP methodology is that it is takes into the, uh, it gives you what the speaker sounds like in the context of the gestalt of the room acoustic, down to the furniture, down to the fabric, uh, to the, whatever's in the room. Uh, these are things that predetermined room placement theory can't dictate because who knows what the room is furnished with and what all the reflections are gonna be. And so it, it's, it's a really critical part. And um, 
with all due respect, the sound of our loudspeakers, whether it be the Alexia V that I'm doing here, or it be our Sabrina, or even our uh, heralded XVX, um, they're only as good as the guy that set them up. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's why we're so, so keen on our dealers being able to do this. And, and frankly, you know, if, if you buy a Wilson speaker used, which and there are a lot of them out there, buy it from a dealer because he will then be able to provide the performance value that, that goes with it. In mm-hmm. other words, it doesn't matter what kind of deal you get on them. They're not any good unless you really have them set up by someone who really is experienced with our process of setting them up. And there are a lot of bright people out there that could do very good setup, but there's something unique to our methodology which consistently gives good results. Okay, well, we're now nearing the end of the project and the process, and uh, uh, since I last talked to you, what we've achieved in doing is the following. We, we properly configured the acoustic diodes, which essentially is the, what we refer to as the spikes for the bottom of the speakers. Um, and these are now part and parcel of the Alexia V speaker system. Normally they sell as an alternative upgrade for other models for around $3,200 a set of eight of them. And uh, they're part and parcel of the, uh, of the Alexia V so that you get them with that as well as with the uh, Alex V and the XVX loudspeakers, our upper model. So that's a, it's a great thing. And uh, they're spectacular because we now have taken the speakers off of the sliders that we had them on that were necessary to do the critical positioning. But once we got them in exactly the right spot, we were able to remove the uh, sliders and then uh, properly calibrate the acoustic diodes. And we now have the speakers so that they are perfectly vertical, both fore and aft and side to side. That's a critical thing with the time-aligned loudspeaker because if, if the speaker is swinging one way or the other, slightly off, all of the precision adjustments you do with the calibration of the positioning of the drivers is thrown off. So leveling the speaker is extremely critical and makes a, a, a clearly audible improvement. And then the last step is we, uh, I torqued all of the drivers to a specific setting. And, um, uh, you know, as these speakers travel, whether they be by truck or by air or whatever, the values that they were set at at the factory can possibly change. Also, there's a settling as the threads settle into the material into which they are dug. So it's always a good idea to set the, uh, the torque values on each of the screws for each of the drivers to a very specific setting. And the reason why it's even more critical on ours is that the screws that hold the basket of the driver, they actually tap right directly into the baffle of the speaker which is made out of our X material. There's no interface. So in, a, in essence, what you're doing when torquing it is you're tuning the, the baffle, as it were, to the material to which it is. It, in other words, you don't want it too tight. You certainly don't want it too loose. Too tight will change the interface resonance and too loose will obviously create bigger and worse problems. So we have a specific setting that I went through all of the screws on all of the drivers and calibrated all of those. So. In essence, now we have the speaker perfectly vertical. We have the speaker drivers properly done and the speakers are properly positioned. The net result of which is we've now spent some glorious time listening. Um, the combination of the audio research electronics and all of the other related gear, the DCS, uh, gone down the line. But in essence, what we're experiencing is some of the most glorious reproduction of, of music that I've experience, particularly in a room of this dimension, which is, well, it's just smaller than what you'd expect, but it's just, you can't want for more or for less. Mm -hmm. And what Lee has done in the treatment of the room is is nothing short of miraculous. It's not over damp. The sound is uh, exquisite. And, um, you know, and I must confess, I'm indulging in playing a lot of my own recordings recordings that I've had the pleasure of making over the course of the last few decades. And uh, um, what I'm getting is what I'd hoped that they would be, meaning that I get a beautiful sense of the hall, the space, the perspective, and most importantly, the tonality of everything. The system is uh, utterly and completely gratifying. I'm hard pressed to imagine how it could be better in, in a space. And uh, 
The only one that might be better is mine at home because I have the XVX. <laughs> and I have a much bigger room. You gave me something to shoot for up here. Life is always filled with aspiration. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. My really pleasure. appreciate that. Oh, I'm so delighted to be here, Lee, and to have been able to, to do this. And uh, I hope that you enjoy what we've done here as much as you've enjoyed what we did five years ago with the speakers you had before. I'm quite certain I will, based on what I'm hearing already. Uh, this doesn't involve me at all directly, but it, I'm, I'm recounting a story, a rather beautiful story that Dave told me. And this is shortly after uh, he had gotten back from one of his customary visits to uh, Vienna. And he was at the Vienna Opera House and uh, he was visiting with his dear friend, Peter Poulton, uh, who is a seriously uh, fanatical Wilson Audio fan. Uh, Peter Poulton is also the head of the library and uh, music direction of the Vienna Opera. So he resides in the library in Vienna. He's an American, but has lived in Vienna for the last 30 or 40 years and is also a very serious audiophile and a lover of our products. So uh, Dave is up in the library one afternoon with Peter and they're looking over scores and, and manuscripts and Peter's showing off an, an autograph score by Gustav Mahler that they had in the library there. And then the, uh, the phone rings and Peter picks it up. He said, oh yeah, no, I'm upstairs. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with, with a friend, but why don't you just come on up? So he hangs up the phone. So he goes back to Dave and they, you know, they continue. And then a few moments later, the door knocks. And uh, Peter says, it's not locked. Come on in. The door opens. And standing at the door is a gentleman by the name of Thomas Hampson. And Thomas Hampson is arguably the greatest baritone, American baritone of our time. A major star, the Vienna the Metropolitan and everywhere. And I, as a classical music lover, consider him nothing short of God. You know, in the sense that he's just, he's to my ear, the successor to Dieschau and on many levels, Dietrich Fischer Dieschau. But Thomas Hampson stops at the doorway and stares into the room. And Thomas Hansen said, oh my God, it's Dave Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that Thomas Hansen is a Wilson fan and a Wilson owner. And he now presently owns a pair of DAWs. But it was, oh, it was wow. really fascinating. It, it's sort of like, and then they said, you know, it, it's Tom Hansen. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so true, that's really it's, it's really one of those wonderful sort of things where, you know, uh, uh, Titans meet Titans, and they're just so gratified to, you know, to meet each other yeah. uh, in, in their respective worlds. Anyway. <laughs>